I'd like to offer an image and then five points. <coughs> the image is of a Mayan mosque in western old city of Damascus. It's a tourist site and a worship site. In the mosque, there's the head of John the Baptist, who introduced Jesus' ministry, and it's a veneration site for many Muslims, Christians, and others. <coughs> On the other side of the mosque, there's the head of Hussein, reportedly, son of Ali, venerated by the Shiite tradition. He was killed by Umayyad forces, and that tension set up the Sunni-Shiite divide. Right beside the Umayyad Mosque is the tomb of Salahuddin Layoubi, who defeated the Crusaders in the 12th century. In 1920, the French general Girard entered Damascus after the Battle of Saloon, which is now just inside Lebanon. And one of the first things he did was to visit the tomb of Salahuddin Layoubi and said, Salahuddin, listen, we have returned. Each of these persons who lost their head or were victorious or who visited this mosque with those memories, had in their being structures of, of fear, political and religious enmity, that became historical realities. All I want to say today is Syria has been here before, and we're about to enter another cycle at a new level. Political heads will fall in elections, in coups, in civil wars, in whatever political and civil processes, conflicts get worked out in. And so now the Christian president of the United States, named Barack Hussein Obama, may be leading an attack on Syria. That image, like the Umayyad Mosque itself, has as many twists as the next five points will, which will turn on points four and five. In these points, I'd like to lay out a, an image of the structure of the conflict which argues against United States intervention. Point one, the layers of the conflict. There are four significant layers of the conflict that lock it up and make it very difficult to resolve, as Helena noted. The local community conflict between various communities, though they are on separate sides of this conflict, mean that there are tensions locally because under the millet system the Ottomans set up, each religious and ethnic community had its own civil courts and still did under the Assad regime. At the national level, the fight is over whether ideology, political or otherwise, or Islam will rule Syria in the future. There are very different visions for the outcome in Syria that are very difficult to resolve or bring to the negotiating table, though it is possible, as we have seen in Northern Ireland, South Africa, and other contexts. The main tension locking up Syria are the regional powers at play, and that is whether there's going to be a Sunni Muslim column of nations through the middle of the Middle East, through Syria, from the Caucasus to Turkey, all the way down to the Gulf Arab states that are Sunni, or whether we will continue to have a Shiite arc of nations from southern Lebanon, um, Hezbollah, Shiite, uh, Alawite-controlled Syria, Alo uh, Shiite now-controlled um, Iraq, Iran, and western Afghanistan. The main tension in this region is the interplay between those networks of religio-political um, uh, expressions over whether Syria will be Sunni controlled or still within the Shiite arc. You lay on top of that international power plays where the West, as noted by Helena, and the Gulf Arabs are setting themselves up against Russia, China, Iran, and some other non aligned nations, which locks up the United Nations Security Council um, and locks up a number of other processes, even though the United States and Russia have cooperated some in, in bringing, trying to bring folks to negotiations in Geneva. These four levels of conflict are superimposed on what I would like to identify in step in note two. That is, the four large group traumas that justify the cycles of violence that Helena named very clearly. And these are four historical and chosen traumas that you can explore the meaning of in Van Dyke Vulcan's website, who is a psychology professor at UVA and worked at large group trauma dynamics. The Alawite who are now ruling Syria, have a history of brutal persecution at the hands of the Sunnis over centuries. Ibn Tamayya, the 10th century Islamic thinker, 
at the time uh, called for the killing of al-Nusayra, which was a code word for Alawites, and that phrase is being used now by Sunni uh, jihadis in Syria. Quoting Ibn Tamiya, let's get the Alawites. The Sunnis in Syria who are a majority have had a history of persecution at the hands of the Alawite regime, which has controlled the country for 40 years. Brutal persecution. Assad, in the early 1980s, parachuted women in pink jumpsuits into Damascus as paratroopers to rip off the headscarves of Sunni Muslim women. Not a joke. I know people who were there and saw it. The Kurds in the country, or a significant minority in the north, have a history of persecution by almost every political player for centuries, and they've been not denied their rights. Then there are Druze, Christian, Circassian, Armenian, many other groups who've had episodic histories of persecution. Why mention all these large group traumas? As the, as the conflict escalates, those large group traumas trigger a defensive posture where each community says, we don't want to go back to that place of trauma, so they will all fight each other, even though they're on different sides of the, of the current civil war and split up in certain ways, as Helena noted, those large group and historical trauma memories kick in, and when you line up, when you line up those four large group traumas which the four layers of, with the four layers of conflict, you have a lockup. What do I mean by a lockup? Helena referred to Geneva uh, talks in the spring of 2012. There was another attempt to restart them in the spring of 2013 where the chief um, preacher at the Umayyad Mosque who was head of, put as, whose name was El Khatib, was head, uh, head of the Syrian, one of the Syrian national opposition groups, was arguing for negotiated settlement with um, um, the Assad regime even though he opposed it. As soon as he was willing to talk to his enemies, there was an end run move by the Qataris and the Muslim Brotherhood who said, no, we cannot talk to them. They flipped him out of power and put in a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated guy from Texas who's a computer engineer, Hitto, to, to replace him. So once you trigger, once one of the four levels of conflict starts, four levels of interest or four trauma groups starts moving toward resolving the conflict creatively, one of the other levels or groups will move to sabotage it to protect their interests. And that's and, and you could watch the conflict move at various times where various groups have moved for resolution. What the result has been the country is destroying itself. Each of those groups say we're not going to back to where we had before. The question of jihad is on the table. One note on jihad is which jihad as self-defense? Which jihad is jihad? The Al Qaeda jihad, the the Sunni Salafist Jihad, the, men, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood Jihad, pardon the slip, the Muslim Brotherhood Jihad, the government Sunni Jihad who are fighting with the Assad army, the Iranian Shiites who are sending um, uh, folks in, a, in, a, in a Iraqi Shiites who are sending folks to protect Shiite shrines, the Hezbollah Jihad who are joining the Assad government, the Kurdish fighters in the Northeast. Which Jihad is Jihad? The major danger from a Muslim perspective in this sitting is what's called fitna, which is a state of chaos that Muslim teachers, that Muslim jurists warn against, that chaos is worse than war itself, um, than, worse than peace as a, as a state of chronic war. So what we have is there are multiple mutually contradictory just causes fighting each other in this cycle of conflict. Point three. The interaction of the four layers of the conflict with the four large group traumas and historical memories for, for people have locked up the conflict. There is a very intense cycle of conflict where the resolution must take into account these eight of the elements, each with the capacity to tie up or lock the conflict. Two points of critical juncture in this conflict. Early on in Dara, there was some wall painting by young boys uh, putting down the Assad regime. Uh, the son Talas of the former Mustafa Talas defense minister was inside the regime as a leader and said, "Do not crush that result." Uh, that he reported within the last half year. Do not he, that he said within the Assad regime, "Do not brutally crush that revolt, or you will start start uh, a cycle of violence that you cannot get out of." The people on the more militant side of the Assad regime didn't listen to him, and we now have a hideous civil war on both sides. And the second critical point is the one I mentioned about Al-Khatib, the 
Ahmad al Mosque preacher became an opposition leader. When that was defeated, um, that finished one of the last hopes for negotiated settlement. Now, why is this important? Both of these acts were driven by the fear of relating to the enemy, which had happened in South Africa, it has happened in Northern Ireland. Last summer, the Queen of England, dressed in green, shook hand with Martin McGuinness, former head of the Provisional IRA, whose lackeys were setting up car bombs in London 15 years before. Peace processes are possible and ways out of intense conflict. Why do I say that's important? Because at, level, at, at point five, the U.S., if it attacks, represents then a direct military engagement of the fourth level, the international level, which has not been directly engaged other than indirectly supplying weapons Russia to the regime, U.S. to opposition fighters. But if the U.S. gets directly involved in this conflict, there will then be no level of the conflict that is not militarily involved directly in the conflict that then has the capacity to negotiate creatively from, a, uh, from within a middle zone position. The U.S. and Russia will then be locked against each other militarily. I don't know what that will mean yet. This will then mean that all four levels of the conflict are directly engaged in the conflict military and less likely to be able to move, especially at the interna international level, for a breakout. An attack by the U.S. would also commit itself to doing something it has trouble not doing, that is stopping escalating conflict. Uh, I could tell stories, others have told those. The other thing I would like to highlight along this point, many have mentioned what's happening in Afghanistan, Libya, and Iraq. Others online, and you can read more about it, but I'd like to highlight it here, have noted that the neoconservative project began in the 1990s to destabilize a whole network of countries across the, riddle, uh, the Middle East, has been described as the Russians, uh, by the Russians as controlled chaos. We're about to set up Syria it's already in a state of uh, less controlled chaos. But if the U.S. attacks, it will add yet a deeper level of controlled chaos to the situation in the region and could trigger a Lebanese civil war, destabilize Jordan, and actually destabilize Turkey, as some have thought. Iraq has argued against an attack on Syria. My main concluding point is that in any de-escalation of conflict, there has to be a change in the emotional process of the, of the way in which the enmity constructs are held. At this point, if the United States attacks, it would escalate the emotional process of the way those enmity constructs are held by bringing an international power directly to the uh, force, force play in Syria. That is a very unpredictable set of events, is more I could say, but thanks.